All right, okay. Um, this is uh, business ethics for a digital society. Uh, Dr. John Larchick uh, doing a Gregorian chant there. Um, and my co conspirator uh, for the last time after 12 weeks, uh, uh, Mr. Lowercase, Ilya Ananiel. Hello. Hello, Ilya. Hello there, everyone. Can you say hello in Bulgarian for oh, people oh, like this? Bulgarian. Oh, I keep thinking good night. Dobra dan? Dobra dan? Dobra dan? Ah, okay. See, I said it in Slovenian. But yeah. Um, so I hope that people that are listening to this, um, and uh, I am recording this, so. Uh, this will eventually be uh, cut up really nicely by Ilya. Uh, yes. Into the normal space, right? And uh, we're amassing quite a collection of these, um, you know, coronavirus corners. You know, you know like I, I told you in the text message that somebody wants to have us talk about the virtual office concept uh, that we came up, or well, you came up with, you know, like where we have a space on Collaborate Ultra and students can come in and ask questions, etc. Because people think that that's innovative. Wow, okay. Uh, but I'm thinking that maybe we should also talk about Coronavirus Corner as well, you know, because uh, we're kind of uh, making fun of the situation that we're in uh, because it is kind of stressful and uh, people are kind of worried and, you know, down in the dumps for the past or since March, etc. that kind of thing. But I think in what we do at this space, I think we try to kind of cheer people up in our way, I think, you know, uh, by not being too serious about the serious stuff that we actually cover. Am I correct, Ilya? I mean, yeah, I think oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the classes were completely different when we were face-to-face, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think if we were actually face-to-face, uh, you know, we'd be maybe showing uh, more, um, you know, uh, YouTube videos on the projection screen, uh, and then students would kind of talk at the end of each of these, and then maybe we'd have some kind of exercise to discuss something, and uh, and also uh, the live tweets that people have been doing now on their own. Uh, there was something that people would have done in a classroom, you know, um, and you know, shared their comments, etc. Um, but um, unfortunately, we're in this kind of uh, virtual space, so we have to do things slightly differently. Um, and uh, and maybe uh, I think probably at the start of the semester, I may have made a joke that you know, this is a radio ISIS three three. <laughs> and I think uh, that's what I think more and more, uh, you know, keeping on my it's it's like uh, being in radio land. And I'm not talking about radio land where people play music, but more like in talkback radio where you have people kind of, you know, being angry about stuff or sharing weird stories and whatever, and that kind of thing, you know. Um, and, and I've always been receptive to people in the audience, actually, you know contributing in that way. Um, but I, I think very often uh, what we do here on a Wednesday seems to me almost being like a midnight to dawn shift on the radio. <laughs> Most people mean you. Um, I wanted to maybe, uh, uh, because what was the scene this week, the final scene this week, is uh, political issues in information technology. And, and I guess there's the usual kind of tons of stuff that people can actually look at. Uh, but and like I told you the other day earlier, um, you know, if you walk into a public library, uh, you know, you're going to be expected to actually read every single book on the shelf, right? You know, you kind of, um, you know, uh, 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 only seek out what is interests you or add curiosity. I think that's the kind of uh, slogan at the State Library in Victoria here at the moment. You know, uh, even all the libraries are actually closed, which is to me a bad thing, I think, you know, because I think. Libraries are a kind of special place in the world where people can go and kind of meditate about knowledge. I don't know about you, Ilya. What do you think about libraries? Do you think libraries are a special place? Libraries used to be a great place to hang out, uh, not just read, actually 
look at people, they, what they did, uh, yeah. their actions. Yeah. Sort of, um, and an interesting thing was too, uh, when I used to sit in the library, uh, was you could even see the different sections which were more popular than others. Oh, okay. So you could see people sort of congregating one side or the second, third floor. You know, the Melbourne Library, maybe. Uh, yeah. you, see, you could see sort of like uh, <coughs> the, the popular books at that time. You know, oh, it could be technical section and so forth. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but it's interesting how you how you described it. You, you don't have to read all the books. And, um, and <coughs> once again, it goes back to your Canvas website. Uh, a lot of students, when they start these courses, they go, oh, cross the amount of info. <laughs> well, exactly right. You don't have to go through all of the information. It's just a small bit of what like we used to say. Um, well, I, I mean, I think the thing is, too often people think when they do a course, uh, you know, that it's, it's kind of, you know, you must actually do everything that you're uh, given because it's almost like uh, everything is an assignment handout, you know. Um, and, you have to cover and everything, everything yeah. in ethics in your course. You'd, you'd be there for two thousand years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's more like, uh, and, and it's more like, uh, like one of uh, like a, a student from several semesters ago said that what he liked about the course was that there was like so, so much stuff on, on canvas was blackboard at the time, right? That you couldn't actually uh, experience it in a lifetime. Uh, but we never actually really cover any of it when we talk about it in class because we always kind of divert into kind of interesting things, and and that and that means that that you know stuff that's actually on Canvas or in the past on Blackboard is more like just a, a resource which you know you kind of consult if you uh, need to talk about something in your individual learning journal, for example. You know, so you know people would often. I, 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 I'd love to know whether any of our students, any, right, um, actually downloaded and you know and, and put it, put, put uh, like a nice category of, um, of folders and so forth of all of the information which you had on your website. But I'd well, love I mean, to know if at least one guy did that. Well, uh, like, like for example, uh, you said to me, right, about, you know, I mean, okay, the one, in, uh, the one new thing in this course, this semester, right, is the Digital Ethics Club, you know, so uh, I think it was uh, Andrew, I think uh, Andrew yes. kind of suggested that in the first week, so why don't you set up a, a thing on Teams where people could hang out and share, uh, you know, information, whatever, that kind of thing, and questions, right, and I thought, okay, cool, I'll do this, right, and the thing is, um, it's more like, rather than me, actually adding more things to Canvas and making it bigger, you know what I mean? Because then it would get like like super large. If, like every semester, I'd be adding more and more things, right? It'd be like huge, right? So, so rather than doing that to Canvas, I was putting the kind of newest stuff into the Digital Ethics Club, right? And then people could actually comment on it, you know, you know do that. And then, even if they didn't, even if they didn't have to write anything, they could still put a heart, you know, or a thumbs up, you know what I mean? So in other words, it's, it's a simpler way of actually uh, registering that you've actually looked at something and, and, and you're giving some kind of uh, uh, an opinion about it, even if it's just, uh, you know, clicking on a, a like, you know, heart, thumbs yeah. up, and click, that kind of thing, which is, I think, one thing that Canvas doesn't have. Am I correct? I mean, is there a question? Yeah, I think you're right. But, uh, you can do it on the discussion board. You can have yeah. like likes. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think on the teams. I, I I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, because because when you're actually using, if you're using Canvas to just distribute information, you know, like uh, assignments and stuff like that, assignment handouts, right? There's no yeah. way you could have like a, a heart that a student could click on. Yeah, you know, like okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's 23 parts or whatever for an assignment and you know, I don't know if Canvas is uh, like the things you do on Teams. I don't think it can mimic everything. No, no, no. But I thought, uh, hey, Ilya, do you have Microsoft Teams open at the moment? You might like to share the Digital Ethics Club. In a can no, you I don't. Up? I don't. Oh, okay, maybe I'll see if I have it. If I can do it, you know, because I wanted to actually. <laughs> I'm sure my network can handle it. <laughs> I wanted to kill two birds with one stone, which is basically um, 
Uh, oh, where is it? Yeah. How do I? Is it application window or entire screen? Yeah, because they're all. Uh, I'm trying to get to it. Yeah, sorry, application. Application window. Application window. Okay. So in other words, if I need to uh, open up Teams, right? Um, I just go to one of the emails, which has got the. the I've got a, <coughs> one of the emails. Get <coughs> a <Spread of> virus. <laughs> <laughs> how do I how do I open up Teams? Right, I, I you think it's probably to, you have to be on our, uh, you know, like in your uh, mail, the uh, Outlook mail through the thing. It's an option there. Oh, it has to be through Outlook mail. Okay, so I go to Outlook mail. That, that's why I do it. But, uh, try and see because I, I get so many emails which are just junk. Oh, gosh, I should filter most of this stuff out. But Singapore or uh, uh, that, 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 this is a to actually your entire screen. Uh, this is strange. Why is this? No, uh, I don't think I can do that. This is it won't let me. It won't let me share the club. It, it's, it's got to be dropping this guy. Yeah. Well, look, Key, I'm going to about uh, 200 emails, and I still haven't come to yours. Uh, okay. Um, I think uh, I think all, what I need to do. Technology is crazy. What I need to do is just. Uh, I need a Google for my. Uh, I, I need a, I need a Google for my uh, my inboxes. I, I, have to, I have to say something about the uh, live tweet videos, but because I got uh, uh, an email from a student yesterday, and I think you you probably got his links as well, uh, because he cc'd you, right? And he said uh, that he was having issues with access permission rights because I think yeah. what the university is going through is a little bit of a change in terms of how. Uh, you know, people store things in the cloud. So they've got like a thing called SharePoint, I think now. Um, and, and there's a SharePoint that we have as staff or students, and then there's a SharePoint that's like a general repository uh, that all staff or all students, I think, can access, right? And I think he was trying to come to grips with that. But he sent me a link, right, um, with a folder that he'd set up in his mysharepoint.com. And uh, and I tested it, you know, and it was more like I just double clicked on it, I, I logged in, and I could see all of his video files, and they played. So I think you know it should be okay. It's just that maybe um, you know there may be some teething problems in trying to work out you know what the file permissions are. But I think if you do have a screen, right? Oh yay! How did you do oh, that? Like, Tell me, how did you do uh, that? What did you do? Just just don't what think. What witchcraft? What, what sorcery did you? Try, try not to think logically. <laughs> Anything to do with logic. Uh. Okay, now, 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 if if we just uh, so, so this is if we if we scroll backwards, the first uh, first thing, right? Uh, yeah. What do we have here? Uh, the last thing, right, is um, an article about social media addiction, um, and I think nobody's looked at it, not even you, right? Uh, yeah. but, but it's more like uh, there's been some chatter uh, in, in media lately about addiction to screens. Right? So last week uh, there was a, there's a magazine that's published in the US and the UK and it's called, I think something like The Week or This Week. Right? And what that magazine basically is, is it summarizes the news from a whole bunch of other sources. You know, so online, magazines, TV, etc. Right? And it just kind of encapsulates what's hot in that week, either in the UK or in uh, the US. Right? And I think the uh, UK version of the week uh, had a, a special report in there about addiction to screens. Right? And on the cover of that magazine, it had like a, a you know, like an art image, cartoony image, right, of a family having a picnic. And they're outside, and it's a sunny day, etc. And they've got, uh, you know, a blanket, and they're sitting on a blanket, eating food, etc. And each person is sitting on the blanket has got a screen in front of them, so they're either looking at their iPhone or a tablet or something like that. Right? And they're and they're not 
bothering about the birds and the sunshine, etc. That kind of thing. You know, so, uh, uh, so I think that kind of illustration encapsulated what the you know concern was about screen addiction. So it's more like people are just kind of worried or in love with this, looking at a screen like we are now, right? And not what's happening outside. You know, so I can look out of my window now, right? And I can see, oh golly, gee whiz, look at some you know, sunny and you know, I think I see a bird or something, right? uh, and, and whatever that kind of thing, right? And then I turn back and this is what I'm looking at, right? Just a little screen with, you know, um, another screen. So it's a screen within a screen, you see what I mean? So look what we're doing now, right? Um, even when we use like Collaborate Ultra, right? Um, Collaborate Ultra is like a screen within the screen that we're in, right? Windows, right? And then within, within Collaborate Ultra, you know, we're looking at teams. And, and, uh, <laughs> it's just so weird, right? So in other words, that's what um, the uh, that article was, I think, in The Guardian, which you can have. Uh, uh, so screen time is as addictive as junk food. Yeah. But you know, you know, uh, in programming terms, yeah. uh, everything on the desktop is a window. Like if every everything that you uh, see is actually a window. Right? Yeah, yeah. Everything has a window. Yeah. So the browser itself is a window. Yeah. And the uh, tabs are windows. Uh, the tab the tab at the top has an icon. That icon is a window. Yeah. And, uh, on the tab is a window. And then you've got close, close, uh, you know, all that sort of option. That's a window. So you've got literally like thousands of windows as soon as you open a browser. Mm -hmm. Everything is. So you're like a, a, like a city apartment with lots of windows, right? Yeah, but, but just imagine the, the, like the processing within Windows uh, message buffer. Um, yeah, it yeah. processes Windows messages for every single thing that is uh, active. So if I just move my mouse across the screen, yeah. you'll get like yeah. 100,000 messages. And those, those messages will be like to every single window. And then uh, if I am if I am the window where the message has been received, I act on it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I see what sort of uh, what sort of message is it? Is it a, lot, a left click? Is it a left move of the mouse? Um, is it a right click, double click, all that sort of stuff? So well, just imagine processing yeah. pattern. Just and awesome. that, but it's amazing that you when, when you when you say it that way that, uh, that what we're actually talking about is a, is a triumph of human ingenuity. You know what I mean? I mean the thing is, like you can talk uh, also talk in the same way about other systems. You know, like uh, uh, the human body, for example, about how the cells interact with each other, the neurons, etc., that kind of thing. Right? And of course, that's kind of infinitely more complex than. Uh, than, than this. Um, uh, so know, on, on, on the uh, weekend, I actually uh, yeah. was watching uh, uh, Steve, Stephen Frog. Uh, he he has a, uh, like a series of AI. Yeah. And yeah. the one I was looking at uh, is it, will, will AI uh, achieve consciousness? Yeah. So then they started going into the definition of what is consciousness, right? And so forth. Yeah. And, um, and they were comparing the two between um, between humans, uh, humans, animals, and so forth. Right? Um, yeah. There's a uh, there's an institute for brain studies or something around brain sciences around somewhere on the globe, and that guy popped up. And um, when when I was looking at it, just just that simple example of just moving the mouse across the screen right, is is so archaic compared to uh, what they're doing. Uh, like AI, AI is not looking for window hand, the handle man. It's it's, it's a way past. Uh, Actually, uh, and at the uh, end of the. Uh, is this is this the thing that you watch from Stephen Fry? I'm going to try it. and actually. Uh, oh, come on, I'm going to try and. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, serious. Mankind. Uh, no, uh, let me, uh, because I'm, I'm getting an echo effect from you uh, again, I think, because probably oh, no. it's your hay fever. I'm going to see oh, no. if this. Uh, 
works, right? Because uh, let me see, it will. Um, how does this work? Okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try something. Right? Um, but don't, uh, don't lose. Um, don't lose. Where am I? I'm lost. Uh, just trying to find. I'm still here. Yeah. I just need to um, get my bearings right. So uh, we'll come back to uh, we'll come back to um, our trek through uh, the Digital Ethics Club in a minute. But I found this. This one. <coughs> oh, no, no, I'm trying to actually show it through the screen. That's what I'm, I'm trying to do. Something. But, you know, we were trained last week or talking about oh, that's it. Let's see if this works. Okay. Hmm. Let's see if that works, right? And I'll make that bigger. Okay, full screen. Let me guess, let me guess. He, he'll, he'll get all the credit, right? Okay, let, let me see how this works, right? Uh, we'll, we'll see if we can hear it, right? We'll see if we can hear it, right? Uh, I'll, I'll turn up the volume. And We'll play it. Can you hear it? I, I don't get any sound. Ah. Yeah, no, no sound. Okay. Yeah, so you no sound. doesn't get any either. I wonder how you enable it to. I wonder, I wonder how you can actually pipe sound through it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that'd be interesting. I, I, I'm not sure. It's just this is a short film that uh, someone did called Escaping AI. It's only like, you know, as you can see, six, uh, just under seven minutes long, right? And it's narrated by uh, Stephen Fro. So, uh, oh, okay. so it's I, not, was hoping, I was hoping you'd say that because uh, if it was Elon Musk, I'd just delete it. Well, I, I think the reason. Okay. I, no, 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 look, the thing is, if I if I go back to the start, right, we can just have a look at that start. Right, right. Uh, sorry. I know how much you like elongated musk. You know. You know? Elon Musk, the old yeah, oh god. The simulation theory. Right? I mean, uh, because I think that comes from. Uh, 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 I think a, a talk that you know, or an interview that. Elon Musk was at where he kind of made the pronouncement that he thought we were already in a simulation, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and but the point is because he, he's Elon Musk, right? Then everybody recopied that uh, and requoted him, and then yeah, and then pretty soon now there's probably a certain because of fake news, for example, there's a certain percentage of the population on the planet that must think that we are living in a simulation. Why? Because Someone called elongated Musk sensor. You know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, blindly follow. Yeah. No, because the thing is, in another course that I taught, um, it was uh, a few semesters ago, it was, uh, it was a usability analysis course that I taught. Right? And yeah. there was a student in the classroom, and she was carrying around uh, Elon Musk's autobiography. Oh. So, so, uh, so, well, yeah, that's just it. The thing is, like, you know, uh, students nowadays don't like to read full stop, you know. So, for somebody to actually go out and buy a yeah, physical. Well, that's what it cost a bit. Was he kidding? Actually, yeah, yeah, Elon Musk, you know, I mean, because it was a bestseller at the time, right? You know, that kind of thing. It was on the, on the hit list for nonfiction, right? Um, and, and, you know, uh, and, and, and I remember, you know, like a few semesters ago, because at the start, you know, we were doing um, this live in a classroom. I would normally ask students that same question, you know, who are your uh, heroic figures? Who do you aspire to, right? Yeah. And, and it was more like, you know, uh, uh, there was a few semesters where everybody would be saying, well, the people that would respond would say Elon Musk, you know what I mean? Th that is the heroic figure that people aspire to, you know? Uh, you know, whereas, you know, Earlier on, right, when this course started originally, it would have been people like Nelson Mandela or, or Gandhi or whatever, that kind of thing, right? And, and then later, you know, it was Elon Musk is the heroic figure. And that's the thing, because Elon Musk, right, is probably good at promoting Elon Musk, uh, the brand. 
And, and the thing is, like, uh, he he got uh, he's a member of the Royal Society, you know, and which is kind of strange because he's a what, U.S. citizen, for example. Right? And normally, I think people that uh, are members of the British Association and it's the Royal Society, um, you know, have to be people that you know are from the United Kingdom, you know, because I think it was uh, Isaac Newton was one of the first scientists that kind of started that. At clubhouse for, for scientists, right? So that was a big deal as well, you know. When the Royal Society said, "Let's give uh, you know Elon Musk membership of the society," you know, so he kind of built that. And so, you know, so, I, I, I need to look up what Elon Musk's PhD thesis was about. You know what I mean? Really interesting, I think, uh, in terms of a scholar. You know what actually kickstarted um, a person's, um, you know. Intellectual journey, I think. You know, um, where they actually finished it, I, I assume he finished it. But, <laughs> but you know, you know, the thing is, right? I'm sure that if you look at Elon Musk's Wikipedia article, right, you'll find that there are at least half a dozen universities, right, on the planet that have given him honorary doctorates. Honorary. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. But um, he, he was yeah. Yeah, like uh, bored. Or to a South African father. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, 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 now, and now the thing is, every once in a while, right, when people don't talk about Elon Musk in the uh, in the media, he has to do something weird to actually get him back into, uh, you know, into the public eye. Remember that last semester, we had one of our students actually point out that his, he named his child yep. after a mathematical formula. Exactly. Some symbols instead of like even Prince, uh, he gave up on, on being called symbol because uh, it's yeah. too hard. So I, I kind of uh, dread the child's <coughs> uh, records through schooling and so forth. If you've got a name like that, it's too difficult. I can't even put it into databases. How do you actually play sound through this? I'm just wondering. I'm, not sure. I'm trying to find something that will enable me to. But the interesting thing was, uh, is, yeah. is to say um, uh, the conclusion, which seems to be hanging around all over the internet, is that uh, eventually mankind will merge with technology. And I, well, I you know, uh, well, what do they call it? Uh, the singularity, right? So, so in other words, um, uh, uh, let me bring this up. Yeah, but it, I can't get away from it because yesterday I thought, oh, I'll watch. Uh, uh, was it altered carbon? Go to altered carbon. All this sleeve business and all this you know, stuff. And then, oh, okay, I'll go over to watch Black Mirror. Go to Black Mirror. Oh, same thing. It's just it seems to be a real hot topic. Saying that you know, we will all turn into some kind of technology. And you'll be able to upgrade yourself. And, so forth. and I'm thinking, oh God, what a future, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know why, uh, I mean, another reason why people might be talking about, uh, like you said, uh, the singularity or uploading consciousness or whatever that kind of thing right, is, is because um, if you look at the history of humanity, right, uh, and, and even, even in, in the course, right, if you look at weeks two and three, right, one point that I normally make, right, is that when you had... Uh, say the origin of Western philosophy, you know, with uh, say Socrates, for example. So you have Socrates, he he gets executed for what he believes in, right? And then that kind of inspires Plato to do what he did, and then Aristotle did what he did, and so on. Right? And then you have um, you know uh, the Roman Empire coming along, right? Uh, which is a very kind of brutal empire, right? But, but but it's interesting, right? If you look at the parallels between that period. Of, of human history and now, right? It would be like nowadays, uh, people kind of think, well, you know, uh, the only important thing in life is is the kind of hard science and, you know, uh, innovation and, and those kind of, that's the kind of mantra, you know, kind of building things, inventing things, right? And, and even uh, in, in universities now, or the federal government kind of has, has pass some kind of law so that if students, future students want to study humanities at university, uh, you know, uh, the arts, right, they'll be paying double 
they'll be paying double. And and you know, but if you do uh, a STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics course, right, it'll be slightly reduced. So it's almost like the government's providing an incentive and and, and kind of saying STEM is more important in a sense, right, for the future than than the arts or the humanities, right? Yeah. If you think about it, right, uh, what we're doing now, ethics in this course, right comes from ph philosophy, which in a sense is part of the humanities. It's kind of the original, because it's about humans, right? But the thing is, it's, it's something that then also inspired other people to develop sciences. You know, and, and the thing is, you have to go back to the uh, person that, um, you know, kind of came up with all the ologies that we take for granted, you know, Aristotle. So Aristotle, right? was the philosopher, you know, as uh, I think uh, Alain de Botton said in one of its, uh, you know, uh, School of Life presentations, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, you got Stephen Fry up, but I have to say something, right? I've seen Stephen Fry live a few times uh, in, in, in Melbourne, right? Because uh, he, uh, and the last time I saw him, right, was at the art centre, um, Hamer Hall, right, here in the city, right? And uh, and it was, like, sold out, packed out, right? And uh, he, he, it was just him on stage, uh, basically just, uh, as some people might say, talking bullshit, but intellectual, smart, kind of funny, uh, yeah. bullshit well, that kind of thing, right? And and he seemed to kind of like make it up as he went along, right? It was almost like you know, like we talked before about you know uh, people being on radio. So if you're on radio doing talkback, often you have to kind of uh, dance with the moment, and you're not kind of doing things from a script. So you have to improvise and ad lib, etc. And that's kind of the field I got from uh, Stephen Fry's performance. But the thing is, uh, the year before I saw him live here. I had paid money to see the same thing that he did, right? Um, because, you know, they do something now where they kind of record events, right? And you can go to a cinema and pay money, a premium t ticket price, right? And see something live. So it could be a rock concert or, or a play or something. And they did that with Stephen Fry's performance um, in the UK. So he had kind of done a tour of the UK going to venues, etc. Basically what I saw like in, in Melbourne, right? And I paid money for that. But the thing is you also saw uh, uh, the backstage preparation, right? Before yeah. he goes off, which is kind of interesting. So you actually saw that Stephen Fry kind of was nervous, you know, I mean like you see that he was nervous. So it, it was more like he was just like a regular person, like I'm stressing you out. There's what nine hundred people or thousand people in the auditorium, etc. Like Etc. That kind of thing, and I think he was actually sweating as well. You know, he's perspiring, etc. <laughs> so it's interesting to actually see that he's actually a real human being. You know, um, that he has these kind of fears. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you put two two people up against each other, Steve Fry and Elon Musk, I would just all bucket loads all over to Steve Fry. He, he just has a knack of how to explain things. Uh, very clearly, and you can see his, his intelligence level is just super, like his IQ must be extremely high. Well, the thing about Stephen Fry, right, he's also kind of been a, a tech head for a long time because uh, he's done a lot of stuff. I mean, if you look at uh, his um, filmography or whatever uh, on Wikipedia, he's had all these TV shows, right? Where he basically, um, you know, uh, explains uh, different aspects of technology, like m mobile phones and computers and stuff like that. Yeah. So he's um, he's kind of uh, an early adopter, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, and, uh, and and but 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 I think he's also um, what they call it, like a like a, like a, a lateral thinker, or uh, he likes to dabble in a lot of different. Area. So it's like a Renaissance person, etc. Yeah. Um, so uh, I remember him from um, uh, what was that uh, show? Uh, QI. Yeah, QI. Yeah, yeah. Sort of. but, but, the thing is, but the thing is, like, there's also like uh, before he did uh, in the QI, right? He he was doing, um, you know, like uh, all these kind of uh, contracts, right? With another person, one of his friends, I think Hugh Laurie, right? 
um, and, and, and Hugh Lowry, uh, I think it was Friar Lowry, I think it was called, right? And, um, and, and a bunch of other stuff, like Jason and Wooster, et cetera, I can't say, right? And, and they'd be writing stuff, uh, all the scripts by themselves, right? And I think when uh, when they kind of split up their, their partnership, because they were almost like an intellectual Abel and Costello or, uh, you know, yeah. or and Bing Crosby, et cetera, that kind of thing. And I think Hugh Murray went off to the U.S. and and became a, a TV star. I think he was some, in some medical TV series, et cetera. Um, and, then, uh, and then Stephen Foy went and started doing things on his own, like, you know, uh, QI and stuff like that. Brilliant, man. I'd love to see what he comes up with uh, uh, because I, I'm certain he's still researching AI. Well, I mean, uh, no, the thing is, he's, he's interested in in language because um, I'm trying to say Stephen Fry. Um, Oh yes, okay. This is the latest. Uh, oh, wait or not? Oh, he's been busy. He's been busy. Oh yeah, this is the latest book. Um, so uh, his latest book, which is twenty twenty, yeah, uh, is is uh, come on, Troy. Uh, the Siege of Troy um, uh, retold. So I, I think uh, the uh, that yeah the Trojan Horse. Remember? Uh, yeah, that was the uh, the famous um, story comes from the Siege of Troy when you had the you know, army surrounding the city of Troy and they bring in a horse with with soldiers in it, etc. And that kind of thing. Soldiers come out in the middle of the night, and yeah. Of people off, etc. That kind of thing. Yeah. So, so of late, I think that's what um, you know uh, is kind of fascinated Stephen Fry. He's kind of retelling uh, aspects from you know, I think human mythology. I think you know, um, Hercules and things like that, you know, etc. That kind of thing. You know. But I think what he's trying to do, right, is it, probably interesting, right? I think because he likes the classics himself, right. He wants to make sure that you know uh, people don't forget them. Uh, so he's probably kind of writing it in his style because he knows that people are fans of his. They'll read it. They'll get their friends to read it. And in the process, he keeps the, the classics alive. Really? You know, otherwise, people will forget about you know uh, mythology and and you know all those kind of things, which is kind of an important facet of humanity. I think. Trying to find uh, the university out. Oh, I need to actually, because because Joan, Professor Joan Richardson pointed this out to me the other day, right? And I thought it was really interesting, uh, and I just wanted to share it uh, because I thought whoever did this, and the guy was actually a. Is actually a quantum physicist. I'm trying to figure out where is it. Oh, here it is. Books. Yeah, I've got it. I should have uh, found this before. Let me see if I can. Uh... Okay, so this is a guy, right? Um, He's, he's, he's a physicist, Chris Ferry, right? yep. and he teaches at University of Technology in Sydney. Right? And, in, and obviously, to make a, a buck for beer money, uh, he decided to uh, not, not just focus on uh, you know, A-star journal articles as his output. Right? So he decided to actually write uh, weird books. Right? So I don't know if you can see that. Climate change for babies. Right? Climate change for babies, right? So if I bring up that page, right? Let's see if it'll show me, right? right. So, so climate change for babies, and I hope that people can actually see it. Right? Um, and it's a children's book, right? 
it's a children's book, uh, and it's um, supposedly teaching in you know, a pitch towards I don't know three year old uh, to instruct them about. And I think that was, I think, one of his first ones, right? And then he kind of went crazy, and and he's got this many books out, right? It's like and it's, it's, it's hundred or something. You see, that's the full list, right? As of twenty fifth of September this year, right? So he he's actually got a, a, a books on quantum physics for babies, Newtonian physics for babies. General relativity, statistical physics, electric, blah blah blah. Even and we were talking about this the other day. Uh, look, blockchain for babies. Right? Yeah. So he's he's written a book on blockchain for babies. Right? Um, and, and the only thing that I noticed, oh, oh, Sean, yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more. Like, I, I don't know. Um, of, of a lot of three-year-olds that kind of would really kind of say to their parents, uh, please, I want Santa or you to put blockchain for babies under the tree for Christmas. Um, and, and I'm kind of tempted to actually uh, buy blockchain for babies to see how... And, and that's just it. He's got neural networks for babies. Basically for, oh. It just sounds that he's picked the um, four babies as a replacement for remember remember the series of books you know, uh, books for dummies. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. It just sounds like he's, he's changed. But see, but uh, but this is like an imprint that he came up with called Baby University. Right? Yeah. And uh, and apparently it's been translated into different. So see, obviously it is for actual babies. So he's got pictures of babies, including one with a mustache. To look like um, Einstein. I guess. Gotta get, gotta get in there early. Scared of the Jesus out of them about uh, you know global crisis and all that. So, uh, but see, but, but see, one thing that we don't see here is he hasn't got any books on philosophy or ethics. See? <laughs> I'm saying, right? Remember, earlier, earlier. Yeah, you. Uh, you need to actually write uh, <laughs> something like you know utilitarianism for babies. That kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, it's more like okay, um, if if you were trying to explain utilitarianism to babies, how would you do it? How would you how would you as a father have explained utilitarianism to your three year old son or daughter? I, I would have I would have run that little video uh, of the tr uh, the trolley trolley principle. <laughs> Yeah, but that's a little bit brutal. I, I did show, uh, I did, I did put up that episode of um, the, the Good Life, I think, right, uh, in, in one of the earlier weeks. Right? If, 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 uh, if, uh, if they were in the room, and I, w I would say, here's here's a chuppa chump, right? and, yeah, uh, go give it to your sisters, <laughs> and I guarantee. My, my son would not give it to his sisters for the greater good. Oh, yeah, but that's like the marshmallow problem. Remember the marshmallow <laughs> problem? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the marshmallow problem. You know, like with the, you, you give marshmallows and some babies just uh, take it all and others kind of share it with other babies, except yeah, for exactly. their kind of, you know? yeah, Look, and if then, I here, a packet of chopper jumps, would you share yeah. it with your sisters? And the answer would be no. <laughs> Okay, so in other words, maybe the baby, the yeah. child, would only share something that they don't really like themselves. If they really, really like something, you know, like to a great degree, they want to offer themselves. Am I correct? But if you have only, uh, you know, a partial liking for something, then you're isn't not kind that, of... Isn't that strange how in uh, management, top-level management, the same occurs? You think so? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the time. I just hold back information. Oh yeah, okay, okay, yeah, but, but 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 yeah, that's a political thing. Remember, it goes back to, yeah. I guess, what this week's theme is: political issues in information technology. Is information sometimes is power? If you know something, right, it can give you an advantage over other people. In fact, that's the whole notion of education. Am I correct? Right? If Ilya, if you get a PhD, right, 
then that will give you some kind of leverage, I assume, right? Um, you know, uh, technically speaking, you know, uh, a doctor. You know, I'm doing the PhD not for any uh, like monetary gain or anything. I'm just doing it as a as a thing on the side to understand how academics actually think. Yeah, okay, but, but I could counter that uh, I, you know, uh, argument. But. To get a PhD so I can run my team. <laughs> the thing is, you could you could just find that out without having to do a PhD. You know what I mean? Like rather than enrolling in a PhD, you could just say, "I am going to write a book about yep. how academics think," right? And then you wouldn't necessarily uh, be doing what a PhD student does. You would just be doing what you're doing now, right? You. It's not the same because I was told that uh, several years ago uh, by one of the professors in RMIT. Yeah. And what did this professor say? You know, the quote was, you know, you don't actually have to do a PhD. You can do research with someone else, right, which will do exactly the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, uh, no, no, not really. It's not a personal feel. And um, uh, one of the things which I've, I've experienced by doing a PhD, I think there's a big box a checklist saying has the student bled enough and, and you can't you can't actually experience that unless you're, you're actually doing that phd bled yeah I, I, yeah it's, it's it's almost literally uh, i'll give you an example uh, i will i will put put a bit of text in front of uh, um in front of let's say the supervisors i'll yeah. rip it to shreds okay then I'll go back, I'll rewrite it, I'll come back, and I'll rip it the shreds, and guess what? You end up going right back in a whole circle, all the way back. It's like the snake <coughs> eating its own tail. Uh, you, you come back to exactly the same text. And I actually experimented with um, one, uh, one professor, this is uh, yep. many years ago, and <coughs> and he he actually wrote some text, right? Uh, on on the thing. so I just embedded his text, right? and a, a week or two later, I came back and I said, "Oh, here it is." He ripped the shred out of the text, right? And I said, uh, "Do you realise that's actually your text?" <laughs> so, so it actually looked like a, um, it's it's like a vicious going around and around. It's it's like a you must. You must rip shreds out of that uh, text, I irrespective. Right? Just must, and it's like a checklist yeah. on the list. It's one thing I learned during my journey. It's just awesome stuff. It's a good experience. It really is. I recommend it to anyone. Well, I'm the, I'm, I mean, the thing about uh, doing a PhD, and yes. this is me just trying to kind of sell the concept, right? Yeah, is it's I'm, experiencing, I'm experiencing that exactly now uh, and you know uh, last week's meet, meeting uh, actually you might not know but <clears throat> I was basically ordered to rehash my model and when I looked at rehashing I actually went back all the way back to the model and, and I'm looking at it and thinking well hang on so why did I it in the first place well that, but that's that's almost uh, you know yeah, it's like Socratic thinking. I mean, it's like Socratic thinking. Right? You know, there's a uh, agenda behind PhDs where it, there's this cycle to say, has the student bled enough? <laughs> isn't that Stoicism? <laughs> what is Stoicism, Ilya? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm going to change it. I'm poured in the shit. <laughs> that's stoicism. It's like, in other words, bad stuff happens, right? So yeah. that's what happens. you have to deal with it, right? So in other words, it, it's almost like the relationship between the supervisor and the student and the PhD yeah. is the supervisor is always kind of saying, "This is bad," you know. And then, you, you have know. to change it. it must yeah, change. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll be back in just a second because my dog is staring at the door. <laughs> <laughs> Life with pets. Uh, they just That's actually something that we, uh, you know, we wish to advise students to put into their eight-minute videos. Right. So if you're doing, if you're wondering uh, how to actually jazz up your eight-minute video, 
So do something like that, you know, because that's kind of an instant way of, of putting in something that's kind of humorous. You know, it's more like, you know, I'm talking about, uh, you know, the problems of automation, but wait a minute, I have to let the cat out of the... <laughs> I have to let the cat out of the blender, you know, because the cat accidentally got into the blender for some reason. You know, blended learning, etc. <laughs> But, but across my journeys in doing a PhD, I, I have not actually stuck on one line. I've, I've been all over the place. And, and uh, uh, with this course as well, I, I came across this thing here, uh, Cornell University. Um, oh, okay, yeah. The engineers there are actually starting to, to uh, basically recreate life. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I don't know, what does it say? The key traits for life are metabolism, self-assembly, and organization so let's look at those three aspects right if they're the key traits of life right i can see two uh, instantly which are in any kind of uh, i don't know business-like structure so so any business uh, that's successful would have to have organization that's a given right because i think that you know you have uh, a course that students do called organization studies in right? yep. self-assembly uh, would be uh, something that's important for business as well because you have to have, uh, I think you have self-assembly within a business, right? Then you can have uh, you know, resilience and, and the ability to actually, um, you know, I hate to use that word pivot, you know, because <laughs> I think, not pivot table, but pivot, it's more like... <laughs> Well, you know, I, that's, that's good. I mean, there's a lot of words now in the pandemic that people say are crap, you know, so pivot's one of them, and another one, of course, is unprecedented, you know, so <laughs> unprecedented, right? But uh, the self-assembly would be like, you know, how when uh, we went into, I think, stage three lockdown, and they said you can't have people who go to cafes and actually sit down, right? So uh, cafes and restaurants, if they still wanted to survive, had to change to go to takeaway only, right? So in other words, that's, that required, in my opinion, some self-assembly because the self-assembly would be you have the, the material within your organization already, but it's been actually designed primarily for, uh, you know, having people kind of sit down within your organization, right? And now you can't do that. So you have to self-assemble and rearrange things within your organization so that you can have takeaway. But uh, my thing is metabolism, right? Uh, is, there, is there an analog in business for this concept known as metabolism? Oh. Uh, metabolism. What's the, what's the... How does metabolism fit into business? Uh, you know, I'm putting on the spot, but, you know, you're the one that showed, you know, a weird little picture from science, but okay. Uh, the definition, the definition of metabolism is metabolism is the set of life-sustaining chemical reactions in organisms. Okay? So, in other words, maybe uh, the analog in business for business metabolism would be there are there are you know um, within any successful business, right? Or any business that can survive, right? Uh, there has to be a set of reactions within that business organism, you know? Because people talk now and perhaps too much about sustainability. Am I correct, Billy? Everyone talks about sustainability? Sustainability Billy. is a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and the thing is like, you're talking about PhD uh, topics, right? within the College of Business, I'd say that's one of the most um, overrated uh, things within PhDs that I've seen. Right? So sustainability would fit into information systems and economics and, you know, marketing, and, you know, you name it, right? So everybody, and, and logistics and supply chain, right? So people talking about sustainability, right? Now, if you look at that definition of what metabolism is, right? Uh, I'm going to repeat it again. Metabolism is the set of life-sustaining uh, chemical reactions in organisms. Right? Uh, so the, 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 there's, there's even sustainability there, but not in the kind of you know, politically correct notion of sustainability that we see when people talk about it in you know, research that they do. Right? You need to have 
um, things that sustain in order for life to actually exist. You know, I mean, life sustaining as a, as a term means that, you know, something is alive because of, you know, uh, chemical reaction. Ah, okay. Um, it's going to sing uh, from Connor. Uh, please do let me know if you are unable to access any of Oh, yeah, the videos. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's just the, the file permission thing. Maybe that's something, that's your homework, Ilya, since you're the tech person in this duo, right? Ilya, you still there? Ilya? Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, 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 I know, but, but you kind of drifted off there. Right? I mean, I, I think what we should have in um, in uh, Collaborate Ultra Space, right, is almost the sound of the heartbeat of those participants. Don't you think that would be a good thing, right? You know, right? If, if it's not actually, but it's just like, you know, like when you see those uh, movies like Apollo 13, right, and they have the engineers that, you know, mission control, and they're looking at screens, and they can see all the uh, vital signs of the astronauts, you know, uh, and that's what we need, I think, in, uh, in our space. Somebody actually post something. I'm just trying to... Up to two. Usually at three, almost, I don't know. <laughs> Have a look at my network state. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no. Why aren't you? That's it. I made your moderator. I don't know if that's going to actually improve your. Um... Am I on? Am I on? Yeah, yeah you are. You are. But I'm just. Yeah, yeah. Incredibly bad network. No, I think it's your hay fever yeah, or, or coronavirus infection. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, I'm better there. I mean, share the entire semester, you've been just spluttering and coughing and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I think probably your family must all be wearing masks around the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but going back to metabolism, for example, right? yeah. I mean, uh, metabolism is a set of life-sustaining chemical reactions in organisms. The three main purposes of metabolism are the conversion of food to energy to run uh, cellular processes, the, conver the conversion of uh, food um, uh, uh, the conversion of food fuel to building blocks for proteins, lipids, nuclei nucleic acids and some kind of hydrates and the elimination of meta metabolic waste. So uh, it's it's about um, you know uh, creating energy to sustain an organism. It's about uh, you know uh, you know uh, conversion of food or fuel for, for building blocks to sustain the organization, and it's about the elimination of waste. So in, in effect. Uh, that's almost kind of what happens in a in a business as well, recreate. Because in a business, you need to have um, something that actually runs the business, and the processes of the business, right? So in other words, I guess what that that would be money, I guess, or you know assets or whatever that kind of thing would be the, the food of business in a sense, right? And then, and then you've got all the other things, you know, like that would be converted to energy, and that would then be converted to things that then, you know, um, you know, create the the business as a sustainable entity, and then there's probably waste products in the business, etc. Like that. So I, I'm kind of wondering, you know, as anybody, there must be somebody that's actually written a book on business metabolism, right? Really? <laughs> yeah, nice Yeah, yeah. Just, just, it's, yeah. it's, it's actually uh, like in business. Um, your your own business is is your division, then your department, your section, your team. Right? They're, they're all businesses that they all uh, basically uh, charge each other within within a business. So you, you're actually in, in a way you're invoicing for your work that each part or each, each portion of the business all the way through. I'm lost again, right? No, 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 no. I mean, uh, no, we, we should have. 
we should have music that plays in between these kind of quiet bits, but I'm just trying to find something to back up what I was saying before. That's uh, from the McKinsey site, The Age of Speed, How to Raise Your Organization's Metabolism. You know, organizing for speed has become a critical component in today's con consumer market. Here are six things that companies must get right, you know, and I, I like it when people come up with lists, you know, because usually people respond to lists, am I correct, like uh, the Ten Commandments or something like that, yeah. you know, whatever. Uh, but, but give power to your people, okay, yeah. Um, and uh, that's politics, I think, successful companies. Uh, increasingly ask employees to play their own judgment and actually drive their organization's success. Yeah? Foster entrepreneurial mindset. Right? Um, you know, pursue your own ideas. Ah, oh, yes, you see. So in other words, if I'm going back to this course that we're doing now, right, I think that, you know, the people that usually succeed, right, are people that do have a kind of entrepreneurial mindset, you know, because, you know, I think the way we do this course, right, is not that we don't kind of spoon food people. You know, so here, I mean, even though it may seem like sometimes you're spoon fit because I'm telling you kind of obvious things, like make sure that you put your name at the start of every assignment that you submit, but that's like common sense. But the entrepreneurial mindset aspect would be like, say for the assignment through video, like, how should I do it? And it's more like, well, you know, uh, part of how we judge, you know, assignment three is your creativity, you know, and people might say, but, but, this isn't a course on you know filmmaking, for example. But I think uh, you can't say that, you know, because you have to say, well, how do you convince people of, of something? You know, how do you convince people that you know something about how to apply ethics in certain areas, right? And I think you have to use whatever is at your disposal to do that. Right? So in other words, one way of doing that is making a video, a film, for example, right? And and. Basically, it's just an extension of, um, you know, Aristotle's work on something called rhetoric. You know, rhetoric, the art of persuasion. You know, so uh, we've always been talking about Aristotle in this course because he did a lot of things. You know, so Aristotle kind of came up with virtue ethics and he studied the sciences, etc., that kind of thing. And he basically, you know, came up with the notion of, you know, what drama is in poetics, for example. And in rhetoric, he tried to kind of maybe blend a few of these things together. How can you actually, uh, you know, persuade people, cajole people, convince people to do the right thing? You know? yeah. and, and, and that means that you have to kind of use a lot of things. Maybe use, you know, psychology. Maybe use ethics. Maybe use, uh, you know, uh, your ability to, to tell a story, you know, in a certain way. Right? And that's this thing called rhetoric, right? which nowadays people sometimes use as a term of insight. That's just rhetoric, you know. But I would say, no, it's more like, you know, uh, rhetoric is once again all around us. You know, Ilya made this point last week. You know, if you do this course, right, how you should be thinking once you leave it, right, is everywhere you look, you should be seeing ethics. You know, am I looking at virtue ethics? Am I looking at Kantian ethics? Am I looking at, you know, uh, utilitarian ethics, for example, because it is kind of all around us, right? And even if you've been paying attention during the pandemic, it's actually unfolding in front of you, you know, like the masks situation, you know. So uh, originally, uh, Dan Andrews said, you know, uh, you should be wearing masks because it might be a good thing. And it was kind of our choice. And in that case, right, it was like purely utilitarian, right? Ethics at play. It's more like, oh, it's uncomfortable to wear a mask, but if I'm doing that, it might help a lot more people in the future, right? And then one day, Dan Andrews said, Mask will become compulsory. You must wear a mask, otherwise, you will get a fine. And once that happened, then it became a new tradition enforced by law, you know? So it's Kantian ethics. See what I mean? So, in other words, right? And that's, that, I think, is the constant tension that's happening now. Uh, in this stage of the pandemic in Victoria, right? Because people are saying, we've been locked down for too long. We want things to open up, etc." right? And it's more like, if you're talking about lockdown, you're talking about Kantian ethics. You're talking about, like, you know, uh, this, this new tradition, the tradition of lockdown, it's a false by law, etc. And then people are rebelling against it, right? If we rebel against it, 
and and people say, give us back our freedom. If we have freedom, right, then we have to kind of, you know, have individual responsibility and then worry about consequences of our actions. If we worry about consequences of our actions, then that is utilitarianism. See what I mean? So in other words, to me, the people that are advocating uh, a relaxation in the lockdown laws, right, they're, they're actually utilitarians in, in a sense, right? because they're basically saying, give us back our freedom so we have the ability to worry about consequences if we're actually thinking human beings that care for other people and so forth, that kind of thing, you know, as opposed to people that just blindly follow regulations, you know. Uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of my little rant. Um, and if you want to actually um, listen to a fantastic rant, uh, you, you have, because I mentioned it in the, my announcement for this week, final announcement is uh, you've got to watch that te uh, TED Talk by Scott Galloway. It's fantastic. And it's the only TED Talk that I've seen that has language warning and stuff. You know, this this you know, may contain foul language because uh, he's an academic from New York University, but he lets it fly, you know, um, and he's not afraid to do that. Um, and you can always tell the good TED Talks, right? They're the ones where uh, Chris Anderson, who's actually the person that started TED, the TED Talk concept uh, comes out from the audience at the end and has a one-on-one -on -one chat with the presenter because that means that he's kind of impressed with um, with what the person said. In fact, that's what Scott Galloway kind of says when Chris Anderson does that in a TED Talk. He, he says, is this like David Letterman? You know, like when David Letterman kind of uh, would talk with some musician after they did a set, right? It was because they, he actually liked the the act, or whatever that kind of thing. You know? oh, yeah, and the other thing, the, the other TED talk you should listen to is Sir Ken Robinson, the late Sir Ken Robinson, who recently passed away only a few months ago. Um, and uh, that's actually still, I think, the most popular TED talk, 60 million plus views, right? And if you look at that, uh, what, why do schools kill creativity? And or do skill schools kill creativity? And basically, Ken Robinson's answer in his TED talk is yes, schools kill creativity, right? And um, uh, that entire TED talk right, from Sir Ken Robinson, which you can find in the learning activities section this week, right, uh, was I think made up on the fly. You know, so it's like eighteen minutes long, right? And and if you, I'm sure that if you listen to it, right, because you're kind of used to traditional RMIT presentations, which have a, a beginning, middle, and end, you'll say, this guy's rambling, right? But it's not, right? It's actually rambling funny, right? And in the past, right, I would actually have assigned that as a, you know, live tweet exercise, right? And what I would normally say is uh, write down your takeaway from that TED talk, right? Because, yes, there is a takeaway, right? Yeah. It's an 18-minute TED talk, right? But most of it sounds like a stand-up comedy routine. He's really funny, and he's making up gags as he goes along, right? But but what the important thing that he has to say is only like maybe a couple of minutes, maybe a couple of minutes of that 18-minute presentation is, is what he's trying to say. But he says it in an entertaining way. So that's what you have to kind of remember about the nature of knowledge, that sometimes, right, uh, you know, you can actually express knowledge very succinctly and very quickly, but then people might forget it. And they might think, oh, well, I forgot. What was the important thing I'm supposed to remember? But because he said funny things around the important thing, then people will always remember everything about that TED talk. You know? He had good examples. I, I, I can't remember them. No, oh, one example was the one where uh, there's a, there's a, a four-year-old in a kindergarten, right? And she's drawing, right? And a picture, right? And the teacher comes along and says, oh, what are you drawing, right? And then uh, the girl says, well, I'm drawing a picture of God, right? And then the, the teacher says, but nobody knows what God looks like, right? And the girl says, uh, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> you know what I mean, and it's it's like, and the thing is, right? that, that sounds like a gag. It probably is a gag, but it may have actually happened to his own children. You know what I mean? Like he may have actually, because the thing is, right? 
a lot of humor is actually observation. So people often uh, pay attention to things that happen around them and remember them. And, some, and a lot of stuff that happens in life is ridiculous and kind of funny, naturally. Yeah. Uh, but, but so, you notice, you notice the example actually stresses the point about creativity. And uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. teachers, so called, don't look past the, uh, oh, look, she's just drawing. Oh, that's why is she drawing it? It's the result of the drawing. But, uh, a lot of teachers don't actually do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the comment that she made, you know, like, uh, nobody knows what God looks like, almost sounds like she was expecting the students to just draw pictures of things that were tangible. They yeah. were, you know, you know, like here's an apple. You know, draw this apple, for example. Right? And and the thing is, if the student then kind of doesn't draw an apple that looks exactly like an apple, that maybe you know draws a sardine. Right? I mean, the, the four-year-old draws a picture of a sardine, right? and they're looking at an apple, right? And the teacher might say, "No, you're getting, uh, you know, a credit or something like that," because you know only people that do exact. Uh, replicates of an apple get a HD, for example, right? um, and 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 that's kind of uh, well, that's not creativity because the thing is, if you look at say the history of the arts, for example, right, you got like Picasso with cubism and stuff like that. You know, the people would say, oh well, you know, I'm looking at a, a picture of a war scene, but it looks like you know a three year old, you know, did it, and it's all kind of weird and whatever that kind of thing. But but the thing is, um, often if you're creative, or particularly if you're artistic, right, you're not a camera, you're not kind of taking a direct a photographic representation of something, you're interpreting it, you know, how does it feel like to you, you know, so, so like an apple may very well, you know, feel like a sardine to a four-year-old, maybe, I don't know, you know, I don't like sardines, but, you know. Personal experience, going to the uh, Melbourne Museum, Museum of the Art Center, um, I walked walk through there and I can't remember who they had. I think it was Ruby or what was his name? Ruby, the guy who has all the morbid, uh, you know, death scene paintings. It's all black. Um, Ruben, I think. Ruben. Anyway, yeah. so it was from uh, <coughs> watching, uh, looking at all the Ruben stuff. I thought oh, I'll, go to the modern, I'll go to the modern area. I went to the modern area and there's this um, red dot with a red circle. I, I look. That's a target symbol. <laughs> and they had people actually crowded around this this thing, and I um, I, I couldn't believe that they, they were actually discussing this red dot within a red circle. I, I couldn't. I I don't see what was like. You know, and, and that that painting was over thirty thousand dollars. You could buy it. Yeah. 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 But there's a, there's a guy called uh, Mark. Mark. Uh, yeah, well, mind boggles. I, I thought, yeah. A guy called Mark Rosco, right? Uh, I'll bring up. Uh, I think it was Ruben. Ruben had a exhibition here. I mean, not had a, uh, it was a Ruben ex exhibition. And there's morbid stuff, like oh, heads being lopped off and body parts. But there's a, there's a, there's a, I always call Mark Roscoe, um, and as it says there, he was uh, identified as an abstract uh, expressionist, right? And what exactly is an abstract expressionist? I hope they have an example in this work here, in this article. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Do they just do these yeah, sort yeah. of things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's an example, right? Of, of one of his works of art. Right? So that's hanging currently in the Museum of Modern Art, right? And yeah. it's called uh, Number Three, Number Thirteen. Uh, and the title is Magento Black, Green, on Orange. And that's it. So, so you know, it's, it's more like, um, yeah, the title of it kind of gives it away. It's, it's basically Magento Black, Green, on Orange. That's it. You know, it's a poem, right? And, I, and, and you've got to think that this artist actually had an art studio, I think, in New York, right? And he'd have canvases all over the place, right? And he'd be just, you know, worrying about 
you know, scenes like this, right? And I think one of his most famous um, works of art is just like a giant canvas. It's a Toyota red. It's, it's like just red. That's all he did. He painted a canvas red, yeah? But I don't think the entire canvas is painted red in the same thickness, which is the same degree. There's slow differences, yeah? that kind of thing, yeah? So, and the thing is, if you kind of uh, read about Roscoe's life, right, yeah. um, he, he, he wasn't a dummy, right? And he didn't kind of, um, he wasn't kind of like cheating people and just saying, oh, I'll just paint a canvas red and then people think I'm a great artist to get lots of money, right? He actually could explain why he was doing things, right? Because um, there was a play that somebody wrote about uh, Roscoe's life, right? Uh, which is basically the story about, you know, him painting a particular canvas, you know, in, in this weird way, right? And he's trying to articulate, uh, you know, how he does it, you know, in this play. And, and, and he kind of had this, well, according to the guy that wrote this play, had, had a, a, like an immense amount of knowledge about art history. Right? So, so it wasn't just that, you know, one day he wakes up and says, I'm going to start painting canvases, uh, magenta, black, green, and orange, and they'll hang in the Museum of Modern Art. So there was a reason for it, you know. Uh, if you purchase, if you purchase that that painting, you yeah. don't get that context with it, and so no. you're basically only paying for this this uh, artwork and the context, which is like ninety five percent of the information for this thing, um, no. is, it's not there. So it's like it's worthless. Um, yeah. So go back to the target symbol. When I look at it, I just went, oh, yeah, target like this, and, but these guys are all talking about it and so forth, and I thought. I went right up close and it says like thirty something thousand dollars you can buy buy them. And I just thought this is mindless rubbish. Right? Uh, <clears throat> but but if, if there was some kind of context like you just explained, then yeah. it actually has the meaning. That's probably what they were discussing. But yeah. don't get that as so if I just walked over there and paid thirty thousand dollars, I'd just have a red dot on the wall. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the play that I'm talking about. About uh, okay, so The interesting thing is, how would someone actually apply or, or send the context with the painting? Do you know what I mean? Um, oh, okay, the... okay. But, but, but you mentioned, uh, I think in one of your comments uh, before today, uh, was it, uh, have a look at my network state, right? And, and the fact is, what you're talking about now is, is a network that exists within any kind of uh, artifact that people create, you know? So yes. in other words, the act of creativity, and, and I think I may have mentioned this before, and, and you know, Ethan Hawke said that in his TED Talk, remember that you didn't like, right? Yeah. Ethan Hawke's TED Talk, right? It's, you know, listen to a, a piece of music that you haven't listened to, and yeah. then you'll be more creative. But but I think the thing is, uh, to me, creativity is doing something that you don't have to do. Right? So, so in other words, if, if you uh, do something the same way all the time, right, then you're just, uh, you know, being an organism, right, that is in a state of habit, you know. Uh, and, and it could be even uh, if you're uh, working in a business, in industry, wherever, right, if you're doing something the same way over and over again, right, that's not uh, creativity. And, and I think there's a kind of difference between creativity and innovation. And I think uh, nowadays everybody seems to be in love with uh, innovation. Right? And innovation sometimes I think is often confused with invention. So invention to me is, is very specific. You know, somebody creates something that didn't exist before, for example, you know, the light glow. You know? And then uh, innovation is, you know, coming up with a lava lamp. Right, so I don't know if you know what a lot of land is, but they're back in fashion, right? So it's more like a weird kind of uh, desk lamp with you know uh, some kind of gelatinous substance in there, and kind of the illumination kind of is moving in that lamp, for example, right? Uh, and, and lava lamps, innovations, or like you mentioned a few weeks ago, that your son spent some money to buy uh, uh, you know digital globes or whatever which have millions of colours being displayed. So that's the kind of latest innovation with light globes, right? Is, is uh, kind of internet things, right? So you have an app that actually regulates the amount of colour that is displayed in a light globe that's in your son's desk, for 
example. Yeah? And the thing is, if you think about it, right, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of, you know, uh, how uh, innovation has actually kind of been applied to uh, the humble light globe, which was actually uh, invented, you know, by Thomas Edison and uh, I think Joseph Swan in the UK, which is an interesting thing with invention, right? With inventions, often uh, people think, oh, there's one person that just came up with that idea. But I think usually uh, it's almost like an idea that flows through, you know, the whole planet, I think, you know, and it's kind of the time for something to emerge, right? And often you have many people with the same invention at the same time to figure out who actually is the person that came up with it first, you know, and I think uh, that's true with the um, invention of the uh, telephone, I think, you know. Uh, it's supposedly uh, Alexander Graham Bell, I think, right? but really it's not. It's some Italian invention. I think that came up with the idea before Bell, but Bell came in first, and it could have been like marketing. So it's almost like Edison versus Tesla, you know, with uh, AC uh, electricity versus DC electricity. And, uh, you know, Edison wanted to push DC, and it almost direct current versus alternating current. Right? And Edison wanted to push direct current, right? And it almost won because Edison was good at marketing itself. So Edison was actually. You know, more like you know, uh, Elon Musk in a sense. So, so Edison was very good at you know, uh, marketing the Edison brand, you know, like creating an invention a week, that kind of thing. Whereas Tesla was a bit weird and probably the smarter of the two, right? Um, and in fact, uh, uh, another Ethan Hawke reference, right? There's actually a new film that I'm going to turn off. This is a new film about Tesla. Uh, it stars Ethan Hawke, um, and it's called uh, yeah. So I, I think it's available on uh, and other places. Uh, you know, at the moment, it came out a few months ago, uh, and it's uh, Tesla. And uh, Ethan uh, Hall plays it, and apparently it's gotten some uh, uh, interesting reviews, right? Uh, but this, the thing about this uh, story, this interpretation of, uh, of Tesla, is that um, it's it's kind of uh, anachronistic, or it's got like uh, modern touches uh, embedded in, in what essentially is a historical story, you know. So. Um, I think it even may have scenes of uh, Tesla actually using a mobile phone, you know, which weren't actually invented, you know, Tesla was alive, right? But it's more like it's got weird things in it like that, you know, so the director actually wanted to do stuff. And I think there's a point in the film where Tesla uh, actually sings a modern song. You know how I said to you earlier that I wanted you to actually sing my way? Or, or, or the, the end by the doors, etc. Yeah. Uh, and that's what the director gets, uh, you know, Ethan Hawke playing Tesla to do. In the film, he kind of sings some weird song, you know, which I think may actually be on, on YouTube. Because you know. the uh, third flight was mostly developed by a Russian guy, not, not Edison. And it was what's that, right? seven years before Edison did. You sure? Yeah. Because. because so I'm going to bring up uh, Joseph Swan. Yeah. Uh, Edison created a light bulb with a bit of carbon stripped between it. But this, this Russian guy. actually used like a metal, metal strip. Uh, I thought it was this guy. Look, look. Oh, this guy, Joseph Swan. Look. I can't see this you. It looks like you. See? Can, can you see this one? Can oh, you yeah. see? Yeah. Hang on. So, Doesn't yeah. it look like you? Doesn't hey, it look like you? 1872 was the Russian guy, right? And, it uh, look like, they didn't say, what was the Russian guy? But see, look, it says here, right? Uh, Sir Joseph Swan was an English physicist, chemist, and inventor. He is known as an independent early developer of a successful incandescent light bulb. Yeah, when, when though? Okay, okay. Let me see. I'll, I'll just see. And this one was 18. Let me, let me see what the uh, history of, this, of the incandescent. Don't say we don't come up with cutting edge things in this course, right? We're discussing the origins of light globe, right? Yeah, you see? 
There, there's the uh, Wikipedia article on the yeah. conditional work one. Does, will it tell us who this Russian guy is? <laughs> <coughs> ah, okay, here it is. Historians Robert Friedel and Paul Israelis, 22 inventors oh. of incandescent lamps prior to Joseph Swan and Thomas Edison. Oh. So that is 22 people came up with a light globe prior to that bearded dude that looks like you and Thomas Edison. Right? They conclude that Edison's version was able to outstrip the others because of a combination of three factors. An effective incandescent material, a higher vacuum than others were able to achieve by use of the spring motor, and a high resistance that made power distribution from a central source economically viable. Ah, you see what I mean? So in other words, right, uh, what Edison came up with was the the first feasible light glow. You know what I mean? Because in other words, it was economically viable. Yes. It actually worked with without error, yep. or minimal errors, right? Uh, and I think that's a lesson to be learned as well. So in other words, right, you j j just can't say, oh, well, I've created the first um, <laughs> you know, invention, but it doesn't work. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like now when people are looking for a vaccine, you know, for coronavirus, right? And they would say, oh, yeah, we'll come up with the first vaccine. Here it is, it works, right? But then it has side effects, for example, right? which is not a good thing. You know, so in other words, right, uh, the prize, the Nobel Prize is going to go to whoever you know, comes up with a vaccine that, that works the best, you know, is effective, it doesn't have side effects and so on. That kind of thing. So, yeah. but, but is, is it correct that uh, in schools and university, instead of saying, yeah. oh, the first person who invented was Edison, should they not actually put the proviso in there so students can actually open their mind and just listen to that one, uh, one comment and see the fact that there are a lot of other people behind it who uh, actually did a similar sort of thing. Actually, uh, I, I, I'd be just happy if I know who Thomas Edison is, because I think I remember um, a few semesters ago, right, I actually asked the question, uh, does anybody know who Thomas Jefferson was? You know, And I think one person said, didn't he invent the light globe? <laughs> You see what I mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> I think Thomas Jefferson would have liked to have invented the light cloak because he was actually an inventor and, uh, and you know, did a whole bunch of other things as well, right? Um, and, and in fact, some people would say that he was possibly uh, the smartest person to ever be president of the United States. And I think it was uh, Kennedy, right? That actually said something like that because when he was in office, right, he had some kind of final opportunity with a bunch of Nobel Prize winners, right, and they were in the Oval Office with it, right. And, and I think if, if you look at the stuff on on uh, YouTube, you know, the kind of off the cuff remarks from Kennedy, he was really funny. Right? He's a really funny guy, right? And he said something like, uh, you know, like. Uh, I guess with these Nobel Prize winners in the Oval Office, we've got the the highest uh, you know combined uh, you know IQ in this room uh, since uh, Thomas Edison was actually in this room. <laughs> so, so well, half a dozen Nobel Prize winners and JFK equals one Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> yeah. Because you know what we what what one weird thing that Thomas Jefferson did. Right? is he took the Bible at the time, right? Yeah. And I think he removed all the kind of, you know, mystical, religious miracles, etc. And he kind of almost rewrote it as a kind of godless gospel, in a sense, you know? So people were often speculating, does that mean, uh, you know, Jefferson was actually an atheist, etc.? But, you know, once again, he was a president, so he couldn't you know, yeah. openly say something like that, you know? especially yeah. back then, you know, otherwise, you know, yeah, they probably burn him at the stake, you know, <laughs> except for that kind of thing, you know. But, yeah. She's a witch. But no, uh, I'm sure 22 inventors of the incandescent lamp for just one. I mean, that's really... Yeah, and then there was, yeah. the, there was the journey into fluorescence as well, which uh, cast oh. me. And then the it's journey true. into uh, you know, the, uh, the LEDs and so forth, yeah. 
But you see, you see, the thing is, when people say, what can I actually do for a PhD, for example, right? And, yeah. and even with something like what we've just been talking about, is something that you know some enterprising student might actually turn into a thesis. It, they probably already have, you know. Um, you know, the origins of something simple as a, a light weight, for example, right? If, if it's kind of, uh, you know, like, and I can see a whole bunch of ways in which you can do research like that. You know, just do a survey. You know, I, I ask 500 people to invent the light weight, right? Yeah? And, and, you know, is everybody going to say Edison or will some people say ridiculous things? You know, Daniel Andrews invented the light weight, you know, or Donald Trump, you know, that kind of thing, you know. And then you could kind of feed back the results into an analysis of, you know, uh, people's uh, interpretation of inventions and innovations. You know, is it really important to know? Who I think was one, one thing I learned or found on my journey doing the PhD was, um, uh, and you know, uh, um, uh, I, actually, I'll, I'll pre preface um, life, life is a journey of making mistakes, right? So you make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To learn how to do new things without making mistakes, right? Uh, in the PhD field, uh, all mistakes uh, are not logged; they're not kept; they're just thrown out the, out the door. Uh, so, if your PhD thesis fails, you don't actually <coughs> have a, an article or or a reference to the fact saying, "Oh, it didn't work." But, uh, and I, I find that a like it's almost unethical. It's it's like just oh, take, just taking yeah. the cream off the top and forgetting about the cake and all that and saying, oh, you know, we've made mistakes, but no one's actually logged these mistakes. I, I don't understand why. It's just crazy. so. You think people should be focusing on mistakes more and errors in, in the thesis? To, to actually say why why was there a mistake? Like what actually happened in that mistake? Uh, does that affect? Does that does that mistake actually affect my thesis? Right? You, you can't even tell before you start. You, you don't even know if you're going to be you know, going over the cliff before you start. Yeah. Sacrilege that I've seen is that uh, articles, articles and journals have actually been removed from archives. Yeah, yeah. But Which is, uh, they, they should not removed. I don't care what was in that article, what was in that archive, it, it should not be deleted or removed. Yeah. I, I, put, I put up some quotes about mistakes, but who actually said these quotes, supposedly? I, I, like, I like the thing, but hang on, you just said, man who... Yeah. A whole bunch of quotes, right? Who actually said these, supposedly? A man who has committed a mistake and doesn't correct it is committing another mistake. Be not ashamed of mistakes and thus make them crimes. Better a diamond with a flaw than a pebble without. If you make a mistake, do not be afraid to correct it. And the answer, who actually supposedly said all these things? Can I, can I go out in a limb? Just as a, yeah. as a yeah. guess. Is it like... Confucius. Yeah, right? Because the thing is, if, if you look at, say, uh, be not ashamed of mistakes, you must make them crimes, right? That's the, the kind of modern ethos of how errors and bugs are treated in software engineering. Right? Because uh, before you had software engineering as a discipline, right? people would say, find the programmer that put the mistake in the code, right, and get rid of it, right? or her. And then uh, when software engineering came along, you had this uh, and other iterations of it, you know, like extreme programming, agile, and so forth, right? Then you had um, an awareness that systems were very complex, right? And that no one person could understand how everything works or, you know, what, how bugs could be here and not there, et cetera. And that's why... Uh, bugs were not then the fault of any one person, but something that emerged from a complex system. Right? And then the, that always makes me think of that quote from Confucius, be not ashamed of mistakes and thus make them crimes, which is then, you know, you should be, uh, you know, proud of them, or not proud, but just uh, appreciate that they do exist. So in other words, if you, if you look at that quote from uh, Confucius, be not ashamed of mistakes and thus make them crimes, isn't, doesn't that 
kind of philosophy applied to the world that you know supposedly will exist in, in the not too distant future? COVID normal. Right? People talk about COVID normal. If we're talking about COVID normal, right, we're talking about a world where we uh, coexist with this thing called you know coronavirus. Right? So the the whole aspect now has been you know uh, you know um, it's like an eradication policy. So the reason why we have lockdowns, right? is to get rid of coronavirus. But it's a pesky thing to get rid of if you don't have uh, a, a vaccine, right? And, and, and a lot of people would say, epidemiology, we have to kind of improve contact tracing and so forth, right? And, and quarantining. So then we can actually exist with it, you know? Uh, and and in, in effect, okay, is, is a virus a mistake? I mean, would you class a, a virus as being a mistake there? Or just something that exists an aberration yeah. and uh, if you listen to all the uh uh, uh and say the propaganda it was a mistake we just sort of let it loose yeah 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 you know i mean there's a lot of people that are saying things right and some people might say so xenophobic comments you know from uh, donald trump and stuff like that blaming you know the countries etc for you know being responsible for you know coronavirus but i think it's just something that is like in software engineering an accident of uh, any complex system you know so you have you know uh, organisms and you know that are kind of alive or not you know and a virus you know i like it when people talk about coronavirus as if it's actually alive it's a virus it's sort of only alive or exists in a kind of living state when it's actually attached to a host you know, so uh, yeah, it's I, uh, I correct that last sentence. I, I would change correct to admit. Admit, yeah, 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 yeah. If you make a mistake, don't be afraid to admit it. Well, I, I mean, the thing is, people have this kind of romantic notion that you know, uh, we as humans can kind of you know conquer or dominate nature, you know. So if you look at um other diseases like smallpox for example and people often when they talk about you know the world health organization or what you know uh, people can do if they work together right to you know combat disease and you know uh, and illness and then they say oh well, you know, people work together and through uh, vaccination policies we uh, eradicated smallpox right so smallpox actually was eradicated right and once upon a time it used to, you know, kill a lot of people, right? It was a nasty thing. Right? And then uh, slowly but surely, right, uh, through working together on this planet, smallpox was eliminated. And now it only exists in, I think, two places, you know. So it's a, a, this, a, a lab in the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta in the U.S., right? And uh, I think uh, another kind of more modest facility in uh, Moscow, I think, right? And I, and I think uh, when Clinton was uh, president, right, uh, uh, he could have actually you know, passed an order to, com to to get rid of smallpox entirely. You know, at least the U.S. Um, you know, a remnant of smallpox in the lab in the CDC, right? But he didn't do that. You know, and I think the argument was that you know because um, it still existed in the lab in Moscow, right? What well, if in the future, you know, some you know regime used it and created some kind of, you know, uh, virulent strain as, uh, you know, a weapon of war, and you know, then the U.S. would have to have its own version to create its own vaccine, et cetera, that kind of thing. You know? but, but also, at the time, it was also like a moral argument. You know, some people were saying, do, even though smallpox was evil, you know, evil and in inverted commas killed lots of people, do humans have a right to completely destroy it? You know, it's it's like if you said, let's go on a rampage, right, and kill every, every well, I'm thinking of animals, for example, and animals have been hunted to extinction, like the dodo, you know, once upon a time, uh, there was a bird called a dodo, I think, on the island of Mauritius, right, and the settlers there uh, hunted it for food, and it disappeared, and there was a, a another bird called a passenger pigeon, people hunted it down, it disappeared, for example, right, so people often have this kind of moral argument do humans have a right to actually, you know, extinguish any kind of living entity on the planet, you know, uh, even if it is something like, you know, smallpox, for example. But that's, uh, 
kind of weird. Too. Some people would say, because smallpox isn't like a dodo bird or a, you know, a passenger pigeon. You know? <laughs> yeah. You could argue that from the towers, it, it was probably more right to have any kind of vaccine at all. <laughs> well, no, no, but, but once again, the utilitarian argument, right, for smallpox, complete smallpox eradication, like getting rid of the last uh, smallpox uh, in, in, in the lab in, uh, in, in, in America, right, would be more like, well, what are the consequences of that? You know? Because the utilitarian point of view would be, what are the consequences? You know, like, you know, I can do this now, right, and it seems like a good thing, right? But, is it really a good thing right? if you've got the last strand of smallpox, right, in a lab and it's secure, for example, it's not going to get out because you're protecting it, right? Uh, you know, what's the point, you know, of getting rid of that or just keeping it there? You know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah. I guess it's a financial thing, you know what I mean? I don't know how much it costs to maintain. A, a ask the guys in prison. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once again, yeah, a good point that you're making. It's like prisons, for example. Some people might say, why, why bother having prisons, right? Because you know, there, you know, taxpayer dollars spent, you know, could be spent on other things, education, building roads, right? And incarceration is more, you know, just keeping people away because you know they were antisocial, for example, and broke laws, for example, and. Uh, yeah, but the, the kind of dream about prisons or the romantic notion of prisons, right, was always, uh, um, uh, you know, what do they call it, reforming prisons, right? And so, in other words, it's not um, that you actually punish people by, by putting them in, in jail, you rehabilitate them. You know, so, rehabilitation is, in theory, you know, the kind of goal of, of a good prison, right? Uh, and, but very often, you know, prisons, you know, are in, in the business of rehabilitation. It's more like just segregation, just putting people away from mainstream population, for example. So, I mean, people would normally trot out figures like, oh, the U.S. has got so many people in prisons, right? And they've got these kind of really bad prisons, right? Even though they're kind of nice and clean and shiny, right? It's almost like people are in solitary confinement and they're in these rooms that kind of suck up all the noise and... All they can do is listen to the sound of their own heartbeat and stuff like that, you know, which is kind of totally, you know, cruel and so forth and that kind of thing, you know. And without kind of trying to figure out, is there a way that we can actually rehabilitate people that are antisocial or that are bad or evil or whatever you want to call it, right? How can we make, uh, you know, a bad person good again? Or good, if, you know, if they've never been good, et cetera. That, kind of, that would be the dream, I think, you know? And I don't think that even something like ethics will work because ethics is more like, you know, can you recognize, can you figure out, you know, how, uh, how something is right versus wrong, right? As I see trying to actually, actually train somebody into a good person, right? Is, is that kind of holy ground kind of, how do you actually do it? Well, to be in jail, you already you've already said I'm not following the ethics. So how would you how would you program? Basically, you'd have to insert chips in the head, I suppose, to actually uh, make them ethical. Oh, okay. So uh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, probably one of the last things I'll show you, since we're kind of running out of time. Though, uh, but one of my favourite movies. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Really, I shall bring up. Yep. Uh, my favourite movies, I've seen it several times. And I used to, when it was actually showing in cinemas, like the Aztec cinema, and often they would be showing this every year, so I would normally see it every year, every time I would try it sometimes maybe twice a year. And come on. Where is it? I don't believe it. There it is, yeah. yeah. Can you see it, Ellie? Uh, not shared. There you go. There we go. Oh, yes. Exactly. Right. Okay. Clockwork Orange, right? So Clockwork Orange uh, with, uh, you know, Malcolm McDowell right, uh, in one of his earlier roles, right? The Stanley Kubrick film, right? Uh, and if you haven't seen a Clockwork Orange, you should see it, right? But warning, it's not a kind of nice film, right? It's it's an adult film. An adult film as in it has mature content, etc. 
or the six years or so forth, but it's actually about kind of what Ilya was just mentioning before. Ilya said, well, can, can you put chips into the brains of prisoners, perhaps kind of make them good, et cetera? And I think that's the, 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 the story of the clockwork Orange. So it's basically, uh, you know, a habitual criminals, right, that undergo treatment so that uh, they're kind of forced into being good, but they're forced into being good by being physically sick when they try to do bad things. So, so in other words, if, if they have a temptation to do something bad, then they actually, you know, this is how they hurts, they want to vomit, et cetera. So, so they get, you know, physically sick, right? And I think there's a sequence in the film where uh, a, a prison chaplain is kind of uh, pontificating about this and saying, this is not right, you know, because you know, if you want to actually be ethical, you have to have the freedom of choice to choose to be good to choose uh, what, what is right versus what is wrong. Otherwise, then you cease to be human if you're just kind of forced into doing something uh, because you want to avert uh, you know, physical pain uh, or avoid physical pain, et cetera, or uh, some kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, aspect of your physiology is forcing you to do something. Right? You know? It's a crazy um, yeah, it's a crazy film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, once again, it's also kind of political in a sense, right? Because, uh, spoiler alert, it's more like, you know, the government is trying to come up with uh, ways to actually, um, you know, uh, mentally alter criminals to actually uh, follow the path of goodness. But this eventually leads to problems. So then the government has to kind of, you know, flip its opinion and kind of uh, revert the process and, and basically make the criminals back to what they were, you know, etc. that kind of thing. And then kind of use uh, spin techniques to actually uh, deal with the situation, yeah. yeah. But the, the thing about, see, if you read that Wikipedia article, Alex, the central character, is charismatic, antisocial, delinquent. Uh, is is interesting to classical music and and other things, ultraviolence and so forth, right? And and that's the kind of uh, the, the the element of paradox in the film, right? Because it's more like here are these nasty guys that you know like to do ultraviolence as a as a pastime, right? But the 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 kind of central character, right, who likes beating people up, right? Actually, likes uh, classical music, like you know, you know Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, for example. He finds it beautiful, you know. So, so that's the kind of irony there that you would kind of think if you were a, a kind of a brutish criminal, right? You would be like a brute and not be able to even appreciate the finer things in life, like classical music. But you know, that's that's real life, I think. You know, people kind of are um, are contradictions, I think. Um, uh, we can be close to the end of the semester. I know, I know. I, know. I, I, I need to, I need to, uh, I'm trying to find an image to actually end. How can they say to end? Are there any words about the final assessment? The release? Yeah, I want you, I want you to uh, oh, say <laughs> No, 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 I want you to say, okay, tell the students, right, that there are two threads in, uh, Digital Ethics Club, where I've put some hints, right? And uh, if you're, I, you're doing it already. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I don't have to say the two threads. You, you are explaining already. Yeah, but can you? <laughs> <laughs> can you just, 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 uh, just um, I'm trying to find something funny to end with. Uh, I have to say it was a pleasure again. I really did, but uh, but I um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd be really disappointed if anyone uh, questions what the course is about because that they, because to me it's it's kind of showing they didn't get it. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but hang on, uh, Aubrey. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well done. I, I yeah I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. I've got something. I've got I, no, this. This might work. Hold it. Normally, the very last thing that I would do is, 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 uh, what's this one? Oh, yeah. I'm not, see, it's not, it's not doing it. Like, you know, I mean, I'm just going <laughs> to.
That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I have it because it's a very last thing I've ever did in the last class. So, so yeah, blah blah blah. Here's some slides, and all of a sudden I, I play uh, twelve okay. folks and Porky Pig going twelve folks. The blue, the blue, the twelve folks. I don't think you can put it up anymore because there's too many vegetarians are here. <laughs> yeah, but, oh, you're gonna kill me. Okay, but wait a minute. Maybe what you should do now is what you did last semester. Remember that one sheet where you have your uh, life lessons? Remember? Oh, my motto. Your motto. You, you bring that up, remember? Because you did that at the start of the semester, right? I think you showed your motto, right? Completely. And then you forgot that. Remember, you, you always said you did that, right? You know, I always say that's all, folks. Right? That's all, folks. I used to do that in my class. I'd so, yes, exactly. You see, that's what I mean. Your life lessons, right? Quick. <laughs> I, used, I used to play Borderlands. Uh, In class? Yeah, Borderlands on the last... Um, you know what we should do? Have just one week where you just play Call of Duty and we just watch you? How <laughs> <laughs> where is it? Why? That's all, folks. So, but I do want you to actually... I've got it here. Not sure how I'm going to do it this way. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll share it with you. I'll stop, I'll stop sharing my thing and you share your thing. Okay. <laughs> so well, you have a thing. Keep doing them until someone tells you to stop, right? And uh, that, uh, from, I think, 19, gosh, it, it, very early 80s, it, like in uh, finished high school, went into university. And uh, this is what I found. And this is my uh, life motto, going through industry, going through everything. But I, I added very recently, after discussions with my son, because he, he seems to follow the same thing, uh, it, he he sort of uh, suggested yeah, but, but why that? So I, I I added it. Actually, I should change. No, it's not your son. It's you're doing this course. Remember, remember yeah. there's, there's one slide where I just had why. Remember why we're doing this in in, in the lecture theatre? Right? Yeah, why? Oh, it, so it, it happened with you, but I just remember with my son. So Tosca, Tosca, that's an interesting name, Tosca. Do, do you know what it means? Charles, it's 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 actually uh, American Indian for first <laughs> firstborn son. Oh, <laughs> actually, I, I've got one more thing. One more thing yes. before we actually call it quits. I'll, I'll share it. And this time, you have to participate. Right? So in other words, right? you can't get out of it. Right? I'm going to ask you mm. and me. We're going to do this together. Right? Oh no. He's going to yes, we're going to read, oh. read the first uh, stanza of My Way, which is written by Paul Anker right? <laughs> and famously recorded by the Sex Pistols and Frank Sinatra. Right? And, and this is Ilya Ananiev and yours truly, you know, Dr. Hook. Right? Uh, and we're going to actually read out in our own way together my, the first section of my way and that'll be it for this is ethics religious society for this semester 2020 semester two so let's start Ilya. you know you know if we both speak at the same time only one gets recorded let's see if it works we'll experiment right and that way we can tweak it for next semester but right okay, so we'll, we'll start now right <laughs> Breathe. Are we... yes. okay, 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 okay. Cool. come on Ilya. come on and yep. now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friends, I'll say it clear, I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I love you, a life that's full, I travel each and every highway. But much more than this, I do it in my way. 
and hopefully you will all do it your way. Thank you, Julia. Julia Sinatra. Okay? We got the clap. We got the clap. Yep. We're, we're 12 weeks. <laughs> I know. We're right? you know? So, Ilya, you're a goat. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Um, assignments and so forth. And uh, thank you. All. all the best, guys. All the best. Good luck for your future. See you.